Hello my friends and welcome back to the next installment of the Divide and Conquer Faction Overview videos, this week taking on as the Kingdom of Dale. So starting off with a bit of lore on Dale, it was founded sometime after 3rd Age 2590 when King Thror re-established the Kingdom of Under the Mountain in Erebor, though it is written in Unfinished Tales that during the War of the Wayne Riders in 1856, the Northmen fleed up the Kelduin River to join with the men of Dale under Erebor, though this might just be a reference to the Dalian ancestors uh, and more primitive settlements than the actual proper city of Dale as it is known today. In 2770 of the Third Age, Smaug took over Erebor and destroyed much of Dale, and he would hunt at night to prey on the survivors of Dale, and it is written by Tolkien that Smaug preferred to consume the maidens of Dale. So a bit of classic fairy tale storytelling uh, from that little bit of lore. Eventually the rest of the people fled the city and it laid in ruin, though in 2944 it was rebuilt three years after the death of Smaug by Bard the Bowman. In 3017 of the Third Age, messengers from Mordor were sent to Erebor and to Dale. During the War of the Ring, Easterlings crossed the borders and laid siege to Dale. The Battle of Dale would cost the lives of both King Dane of Erebor and King Brand of Dale at the gates of Erebor, but when news of Sauron's defeat reached the north one week after, the remaining armies sallied out from Erebor to break the siege and rout the Easterling force, with Thorin the Stonehelm II and Bard II crowned as the new kings of Erebor and Dale. So in Divide and Conquer, Dale has been rebuilt, it is the year 2980, though the economy of your nation is very crippled after the as an after effect of Smaug's destruction and the reconstruction of both Lake Town and Dale. So, starting off with Dale, starting off with settlements, you do of course have the city it is named after Dale itself, Esgaroth the Lake Town, which is actually in lore a rebuilt settlement of Lake Town. The initial was basically all but destroyed by Smaug, and the newer Esgaroth was moved further up the river, so this is not the original Esgaroth from a few hundred years prior, or I guess it would be. 170 years give or take 180 years uh, you guys can do the math on that one you also have Grasgard directly to the east not a official settlement in the lore but a Dalian village nonetheless and finally down in the south you have Burr Kaupis, as I think it is called though there might be a different pronunciation I've always just called it Burr Kaupis. nearby rebel settlements on turn two you do have Burr Graham which is to the north and I don't know the actual meaning of the word burr, but I'm sure one of you will mention it in the comments. At least I ask that you do. Uh, that is it for the north side here, as the rest is then Kirk Gathal of the Iron Hills. Farther east, you do have Burmar Linge and Condovan. To the south, you have Alanin, Rawberg, Burr Alge covered by Dol Guldur in the southwest, and then Aaron Ruinen also covered by Dol Guldur in the southwest. The Rebel Settlements, you only have a few, Burgram, Burmar Lynch, and Condovan. Uh, everything else is already occupied by either the Easterlings or the Dwarves, or, you know, if you go into Darwinian, eventually Darwinian will scoop these up. But you do have some options for Rebel Expansion, especially much into Rovanion, which is a very open territory. So starting with nearby expansion, I would recommend, you definitely want to go for Burmar Lynch. You do have a starting army here, and then into Condovan. Burgram could be useful for you, though it does have a very large garrison of nine units, of which I know there are at least privateer axemen. There might be privateer cavalry in this as well, plus a Rovanian garrison. So it is not an easy settlement to take. It is also only a Mountain Bailey, so the initial tier of castle, and there's no other construction in it. So it's kind of questionable if you want to go for it or not. I typically personally will not go for Burgram, and I'll just let the dwarves eventually take it, um, unless they haven't taken it for a while and I just have the money and military to spare. I just find that garrison is a bit too high for a wooden castle. Maybe if it was like the upgraded version, it might be a bit more useful. But predominantly, you will be fighting Dol Guldur to yourself and the Easterlings in your far east. You can also take up some of the Rovanian settlements, though Dorwinian will be quick to take these and you will deal with the orcs in the south that want to block your way to that. So next we'll look at the starting characters. So in the city of Dale, you do have King Bane, the son of Bard the Bowman. He has 
No special, like, uh, biographies or anything, but he does come with Iron Fist as his ability, uh, which is a very strong one for 150 seconds, um, or cooldown of 150 seconds, but for half a minute, permanent fatigue reduction and 150% army effectiveness, so solid ability there, and there is his strategy map model. In Esgaroth, you do have Vidusith, who is, as far as I'm aware, not a named character either. But he does come with Lake Town Pikeman, and I don't think he has a special ability. No special ability on him, but he is good at being a bureaucrat. Yes. Uh, King Bane has the standard Royal Guardsman as his bodyguard. In Grasgard, you do have Bjorn, who I don't believe is... Is he tied to the family tree? He's like an offshoot, so he's like the son of Halward, who we'll get to shortly. Uh, Bjorn also just comes with the standard Royal Guardsman. In Burkalpis, you do have Halward, again, not a significantly like named character or anything in the lore just a salesman standard bodyguard again the royal guardsman and in this fort here just to the west of burmar lynch you do have prince brand who is your second custom bodyguard character and your faction heir he comes with the hearth guard who are a very very good general's bodyguard um one of the better one of the best units of dale actually so that's pretty much it for your starting characters. For starting military, as you can see here in the fort, you do have Dale Cavalry, two Dale Swordsmen, and a Dale Longbowman. In Burkalpis, you have a Northman Militia. In Grasgard, you have Militia and Northman Archers. In Esgaroth, a unit of Dalian Swordsmen, Longbowmen. And in Dale, Northman Militia, Northman Archers, and Athala Rangers. So that's pretty much it for your initial military. And you also have Admiral Bondi, who is leading your navy just a standard long ship here i don't believe let me just double check this i believe you only get the long ships yep that is correct so only the standard long ships can be trained by you dorinian and rune who are the only other naval powers in this region so then we go on to changes from version 4.6 to version 5 so the first change is the iwulthiata horse guards are now available anywhere from your level 2 stables uh, Dale itself has a brand new settlement model here. As you can see, it's been freshened up, and I think it absolutely looks brilliant. The Woodland Scouts that you get from the um, Woodland Realm have been changed to the Woodland Wardens, which are the Javelin Elves. Additionally, for the map itself, there has been a crossing added here at Thranduil's Halls to allow for a direct trade route between the city of Dale and Thranduil's Halls. Previously, it was just a river here with no crossing, and the only trade route was between Lake Town and Thranduil's Hall. So expect a bit more of a monetary gain if you play as Dale, and also if you play as Thranduil himself. You get a little more money now. Uh, Two Star 8, which was um, before Brown Boat, has had the Rovanian Hidden Resource attached to it, which allows for Rovanian units to be trained here. Um... Though, one thing I did notice in my testing, Fur Alge does not actually have that resource, and it really probably should, and I'll get more into that shortly in the video here. Um, the unit cards have also been updated, as you can see here, and we'll go through the whole roster in the second portion, so you can look at all of the new unit cards. And also, there have been updated agents, strategy map models for Dale, uh, as well as unit cards, so I don't have the Diplomat recruited here, but he does come with a new campaign strategy map model and unit card there. Um, additionally, all of the um, allied units, which are a part of the script, for the Dwarven ones, they come from anywhere in the kind of northeastern section, so you'll be able to get uh, King's Warriors and Erebor Infantry everywhere from Dale, Esgroth, Grasgard. Basically, just draw a line from Condovan to Skarn, and anything north of that. It does not include anything around the Sea of Rune, but you will get Dwarven allies from this line and then north and east of this area. I believe you'd also get them in Erebor should you take that, but I'm not 100% certain on that. And your Elven units, they can be gathered from Dale, Eskaroth, all of the Mirkwood settlements, and then Burr Alge and also Tusture. But anything farther to the south, you will not get Elven units, so not in Burr South, it's for any of the other bordering regions. So going on to that, about these scripts, as I've pretty much gone through it, uh, the script is the Allegiances, Allegiances of old. I tried to say alliances there, but I wanted to say allegiance. So as long as you are allied to Erebor or to Thranduil, you will have access to a few select units from their faction that have gone over in your Tier 3 and above Town Hall. So you don't get them in the Tier 2, or actually you do get them in the Tier 2, my mistake. And then I think in the Tier 4, at the Royal Hall, 
So tier two, you will get Erebor Infantry and Woodland Warden. So you get some nice Dwarven Infantry and some nice Javelin Elves. And then at the higher two, you get the uh, King Shield, a very durable Shield and Spear Dwarven unit, and the Woodland Sentinels, a very respectable, high accuracy, high range Elven unit. Uh, you do have to keep the alliances with the factions in order. So if you break your alliance, you will no longer be able to train towards. If you break the alliance with them, or if you break the alliance with Thranduil, you will no longer have their units. So there can be some risk to that, where in the case that should Erebor and Thranduil's halls decide to go to war, you will have to pick one or the other and you will lose access to the other unit. Granted, this isn't a guarantee and I haven't really seen it ever happen in my experience, but that's not to say it is impossible because they do not start allied to each other. The dwarves are only allied to you and the other dwarves, and the Woodland Realm is only allied to you, Kaza Doom, and Dorwinian, and typically they'll get allied to the Bjornings as well. But there is always the chance that Erebor may end up going to war with the Randall's Hall, so that is always a potential concern. Typically they will reach an alliance, but you never really know, so just keep a Keep wary of that, that that could happen in your campaign. And that pretty much does it for the campaign map side of things. There is also new generic strategy map models for the towns, which you will discover as you upgrade. Um, I, I might overlay them here so you can see them all. In fact, at this point, yeah, I'm going to overlay the strategy map comparisons, which are also in the Divide and Conquer Discord. You can see them there or here on the video now. And now coming back to the campaign map, Finally, we'll just go into like barracks and military recruitment and all of that. So you have no real restrictions since the restrictions have been lifted. You have pretty much access to every tier. So if you go to your marketplace, you can go up to the merchant's quarter, your sea trade, you can go up to Docklands. You do get tier four armor, but only as long as you are allied to the dwarves. Uh, so you do get the dwarven armor, uh, which gives you tier four, which is a nice boost to have. It unlocks some... Uh, I believe it gets you some special visuals. If not, it just gives you higher two armor. And you do get the banks as well, which are very good at making additional money. As for military recruitment, Dale has the kind of standard medieval two split, where you have the stables, which give you at tier one Dale cavalry. At the Earl stables, you do get the Ibothida horse guards and the Earls. At the barracks, you do get Dalian swordsmen, billmen, and Gadrots at tier one. Guard Barracks will unlock Swordmasters and Lake Town Pikemen. With the Army Barracks at the final tier of Royal Hall, we'll add the Barding Herod and the Barons to your faction. Then going on to your Archery Range, this is where Dale really shines. Tier 1 does give you Dalian Longbowmen and Athala Rangers in all the Rovanian regions, which I'll get to in a moment. And then the Archery Range adds on the Barding Marksmen and the Hearth Guard. Outside of that, you also get the Merchant Skill, which can allow you to train a single merchant, should you get the uh, Master Merchant Skilled. You do get the Weaponsmith Guild, and you also get the Archer's Guild, which will give you Barding Marksman and Hearthguard if you manage to get the Headquarters. Though, honestly, good luck getting these buildings, because guilds are very difficult to get as the player faction currently, and that is definitely subject to change, because there's been a lot of... Even I'm not too happy about it, it's very difficult. I'm playing a Gondor campaign right now, and I'm trying to recruit every single infantry unit I can from Mortar. I built the full blacksmith line. I've been retraining units in Mortar for armor. I am not getting a single weaponsmith guild. I just cannot get the points to do it. So it's nearly impossible and very difficult to actually be able to get these guilds currently in the mod. So you will typically get them in AI factions because AI factions have some sort of guild point boost. Um, but if you do manage to get that, it is nice to have the Order of the Black Arrow because these guilds also allow you um, to retrain many of your units. So they kind of function almost like a way station where the Order of the Black Arrow will allow you to retrain all archers quicker and it also helps to retrain your current archers. Same with the Warriors Guild. If you get the Urban Weaponsmiths Guild, expect to also be able to retrain like Barding Herod if you have them in the far front lines and that's where the guild is. But that's pretty much it for the guilds. Now I will talk about the Rovanian resource so essentially, uh, with the Athala Rangers, for example, this is what had me probe this for information. It mentions that they are available from East Mirkwood to Darwinian, uh, but that is actually misleading. That needs to be changed, um, and I'll probably go ahead and mention this to Lord of Links and maybe make the change myself. 
They can actually be recruited everywhere from Dale eastwards all the way to Skarn, so everything in this region. They cannot be recruited around the Sea of Rune. They can be recruited in Dorwinian, I believe up to Strondost and Murnethel, and all of the Robanian regions here. However, they are not recruitable in Burt Owls, and I believe this is an oversight. Um, it probably should have the Robanian resource attached to it, because you can get them in Esgaroth, and you can get them in Dale, but for whatever reason, you can't get them here in Burt Owls, but yet you can get them in Tusturde and Raburg and Bursalthus, Logarth, Caravarad, Ilanin, so it's Bit of an oversight, I believe, so I am going to petition for that to be changed by the time version 5 is officially released and all the hotfixes are done. But just something I wanted to give notice to, just one for the little current bug that currently exists um, in the game. So that's pretty much it for the campaign map. Uh, a decent number of changes to Dale. Last thing I will say is that Dale is going to be the subject of a at least a military overhaul going into version 6. Um, perhaps some campaign changes as well, because they don't have much for script, really. Uh, I know a lot of people request, like, uh, you know, an Easterling attack on Dale, but typically, this is kind of the stance that the mod takes, is having, like, forced battles like that, that are just kind of thrown on you by a script, is typically reserved for very special circumstances, such as, like, being at Khazad Doom, for example, or playing as the Goblins, or playing as the Dwarves, where you have to deal with the stacks over here. Um, like for the Dwarves, the Balrog, or the Balrog in Arid Luin, but that is controllable at Buzzard Doom. The only other instance I can think of currently, in which case a script causes a forced attack, is the invasion at Mytholand, but you're playing the Elves and you're typically very safe here anyway. So it's been kind of met with a lot of resistance, so don't know for sure if an Easterling attack will ever come to Dale through the form of a script, but it is a possibility. The uh, version 6 details haven't been quite worked yet, but that is just to give you a little hint of what will be happening in version 6. I can say that the visuals I've seen for Dale's new units um, looks absolutely brilliant. So I'm excited for that. But that is the topic of a future version 6 changelog video. I will now give my last bits of advice for Dale before I move on to the battle map. And that is use the Kelduin River to your advantage. You basically have this almost uncontestable highway that you can transport units down here all the way to get to the sea of rune it is much quicker to go by boat than it is by land if i take bjarn and i want to walk him to Winterian eor that is the yellow line typically means 10 turns so 10 to 11 turns to walk there but if i take someone like uh yes. i don't know we take vidusith maybe we'll take one of these guys here at the town and i put them in the ship I can now make it down there in probably six turns, so blue line, that is uh, one. Oh, didn't get to see how many that was. I want to say that's six turns off the top of my head. One, two, three, four, five, plus the turn we just moved. So six turns versus like 11 turns. It does allow you to transport your troops pretty much twice as fast. So use the river to your advantage is my big piece of advice for playing as Dale. Additionally, Help Dorwinian out with Dorgildur in the south. You will have the um, Woodland Realm to help you with that um, with that section as well. So you'll have some allies here. Helps to clear away Dorgildur and allows Dorwinian to kind of focus on rune for you while you work your way down the river and set up supply lines to get your troops down here. Uh, the hardest thing with Dale, I would say, is probably the economy. It does start off very weak. Plus the fact that you have a very, very widespread um nation like you're a very long linear nation basically just following the river you will have issues with corruption so if i was to check for calpus right now it probably doesn't have much it is losing three 256 gold uh to that settlement so it might be a good idea to make grasgard for example your uh capital right now so if i do that i don't lose really any money over here but i make a little bit more from Ber calpus it saves about 100 gold so my advice is move your capital. Since these are big cities, you can get all the law buildings and have good governors in here that you don't need to worry about corruption. But maybe move your capital to Burr Calpis if you take Burr Alge, Ilan, and Robberg and all of that. Um, as you get farther and farther um, into Rune, you're going to suffer a lot from the corruption issues. So just make sure that you move your capital because it doesn't make sense to have it all the way at your farthest nation. Um, lastly, the other thing I will say um, you are an archer nation, use your archers um, a lot, they will carry you through many battles, 
And watch out for Gundabad in the north. While they don't take with a border or an Asnar in the auto expansion, uh, they do have a lot of powerful armies. And typically, from what I've seen in campaigns, they do end up reaching to Erebor and oftentimes besieging Erebor. So keep an eye on your dwarven friends and make use of these two forts here in order to save as much money as you can. So I went on and said a bit more than I thought I was going to there, but that's pretty much it for Dale. Uh, a very, you know, different faction, I think. Fun archers, and it's fun having the mix of elves and dwarves. I will now take it over to the battle map. And now we are here on the battle map, and the order we're going to go is bodyguard, militia, infantry, archers, and cavalry. I'm a big fan of that type of orientation. So, beginning with the bodyguard of Dale, they have the Royal Guardsmen, a very unique archer and bodyguard in the sense that these men have 8 attack, 7 missile, and 21 defense. Their archers are... They use black arrows, meaning that they have armor-piercing bows, and they come equipped with the sh uh, spear and the shield. So an excellent bodyguard. AP arrows are not super common. Uh, they're really only across a few units that I can think of, being two units in Dale's roster, the Dunedain bodyguard, the steel bows, and there might be a couple of other random armor-piercing bows that I can think of. The elves must have some. But... And they also show the fact that they have a spear, meaning that they are great against cavalry. Should they get charged, they will hold their own. Though keep in mind the general is always a little bit vulnerable from the side here. But they are a very, very nice bodyguard. Five shield means that they can counter skirmish with other archers, plus their 10 defense. They have 24 uh, missiles with 170 meter range with a high accuracy. So an excellent bodyguard. And they kind of take the look of the classic warriors of Dale that are seen in the Hobbit films. So a great unit, though they are kept in check by their lower number being a bodyguard. So next online, we have the Militia. So I'll start with the Northmen Militia here, clad in rags and cloth tunics and whatever other brown stuff they managed to find to put on their clothes. These are a four attack, six charge, but only three defense unit, poor morale, poor morale response being a Militia tier unit. Oh, excuse me, I have the hiccups. But they do have armor piercing, which gives them some utility, especially up against the enemies you will be facing, such as Dorgoldur and Rune, who do have some very high armored units, so the Northmen Militia can find some use in those fights, especially if they can get on top of a bodyguard. Though their poor defensive stats mean that they are very vulnerable to pretty much anything that comes their way. Best used as a supporting shock troop, though don't expect too much out of these men at the end of the day, they are very low tier, but it is nice having access to a very cheap armor-piercing unit such as these Northmen Militia. Next to them, I do have the Northmen Archers, so branch just like them, 2 attack, 3 missile with 3 defense, only 18 missiles, 160 meter range, and low accuracy. They're pretty, honestly, garbage. I think they're even worse than the Anduin Vale, uh, vale Archers. I think those at least have average accuracy, and uh, they also share 3 missile attacks, so not that great, but they are cheap, and you can use um, archers. I mean, sheer volume of fire will get you plenty of kills. Um, don't expect them to be, you know, slaying anything with armor or to be effective at long range, but they can be useful shooting weaker things or counterfiring against other archers. Just a standard bow militia unit there. And finally, behind them, we do have the Rivermen, a javelin unit, three attack, seven defense. They are not armor piercing javelins. Uh, they get three shots with 55 meter range and average accuracy, but only four defense. Being that they have a higher missile attack, they are prone to getting targeted by um, enemy archers. So don't, if you're up against other archers, have cavalry to support these guys so they can actually get into position without being shot to death. But honestly, more than likely, they're going to get shot to death. I mean, even Merkwood scouts and Merkwood hunters, like low tier archers, can basically take these guys down relatively quickly at range. So... Not the most durable, but it is nice to have a javelin unit since they have so much burst damage at close range. Good if you can flank or just throw into, like, say, a cavalry um, unit like Warg Marauders or maybe even, even the Runet Cavalry. Their javelins will do a lot of damage to, but they are pretty much glass cannons. And after they've used their javelins, they don't have much else going on. Just three attack, four defense. Not particularly great in melee, but they are plentiful everywhere and they will at least... You know, this, these three units will at least hold their line up against, like, basic goblins for the most part. But don't expect too much out of the Northmen Militia, as they are just Militia. 
Now, we'll go on with the infantry from the Barracks line, starting off the Dalian Swordsman. A 6 attack, 11 defense, average morale Swordsman unit. Nothing too special here, but I do consider, you know, these early tier sword units to be kind of bread and butter. They're basically equivalent to Gondor Militia. I think they have one more armor or one more defense skill than the Gondor Militia, who I believe have only 10 defense. Uh, so a little bit better in that regard. 177 men, um, not too fancy. Uh, they do get armor upgrades. I forgot to mention the Royal Guard get armor upgrades, but also the Dalian Swordsmen and the other Dalian specific tier units do get visual upgrades, in which case they'll take they'll take down the uh, Lake Town Pikeman unit. Uh, look, we'll get to that later on. I'll show all the visuals after this part. The standard, standard kind of sword and shield unit, I recommend getting a good amount of these guys as your infantry core. Second off, we have the Dalian Billmen, so a early tier halberd unit. 4 attack, 8 defense, uh, kind of like the Saraline Mercenaries. They are effective against armor there, uh, so they can do you know good damage up against more elite units. But they do have the Spear Wall. It is not actually that effective at the end of the day. Up against uh, like Cavalry, they will not be able to stop charges that well, so don't let them take a charge, but they should be used to respond. And sorry for the cut there. My cat was bugging me to go back outside, and then I was like, oh, it's time to feed him. Anyway, back on to the Rogonian Godrots, your standard rank and file spear unit, which I do want to say I love the designs on the shields, the dragons on these guys I am a big fan of. Anyway, 4 attack, 5 defense, fifth, uh, not 5 defense, 5 charge, 15 total defense, mostly comprised of defense skill with a good split of armor and shield there. These guys are very good at holding the line. Average morale and average morale response, so they are susceptible to shock and terror from other elite baddies. But they do also have the shield wall, and these guys are a fantastic defensive unit. Shield wall can help them to withstand cavalry charges even better, or push into a weaker foe and spread out the enemy and push into their ranks. Great shields. I love the kite shield design. It's good to have um, a good number of these guys just to hold your line and especially protect flanks from cavalry or protect your archers from cavalry so they can be pretty useful at that role. They won't kill super fast, being spears and only four attack, but they will defend for a very respectable amount of time for their tier. So it's always good to have these Rovanian Godrots. You know, they are only coming from Rovanian region, so that does need to be taken into consideration as to where they are recruited. But for the most part in your campaign, you'll be able to get these guys wherever you go, as long as you go, you know, towards Darwinian and Rune. That does it for the first tier of the barracks. So going into the guard barracks, the second tier... We first off have the Lake Town Pikemen, a 4-4-15 pike unit, so very good stats there, being that they are pikes. Basically, these are just upgraded Godrots without the shield, but they do get a higher armor stat to compensate, so they're still good against incoming arrow fire, though they are not good up against incoming crossbow fire, so that can be an issue. They do have upgraded morale at good at both morale and morale response. Standard movement speed. A great unit to have. Um, pikes are always super useful and very good at holding the line. A strip of pikes is if you put them in defensive mode, they will hold their spears and keep the enemy in place without moving themselves. But once you take off guard mode, they'll start to push into the enemy and they'll be able to do a lot of damage. It's always a good idea to have pikes if you can get them, so I highly recommend getting as many of those guard barracks around just to get these Lake Town pikemen as you can. Though the Ravanian Godrots will suit you from the first tier of barracks, until you can get the Lake Town Pikemen. A solid unit here, and they are Vidu Sith Bodyguard. They do have a visual upgrade, which I will show later on, in which case they add on a uh, plate armor on their uh, chest pieces. Next to them, we have the Dale Swordmaster. So a 152 strong unit, 13 attack, 15 defense, same kind of armor setup as the Pikemen there, 9 to 6. Um, good morale, high charge of 7 with 13 attack. These guys will do damage for you, though keep them away from enemy cavalry and keep them away from crossbow fire. Outside of that, they will be excellent warriors with a much higher attack than those Dalian Swordsmen. In that they are two-handers, they do have slower attack speed, and they aren't the best of the Swordmaster units. They're definitely, I would say, middle of the ground, maybe middle higher of the road when it comes to anything labeled Swordmaster. Uh, but they will do you respectable work. Keep them away from cavalry. They'll cut through any Balkoth spearmen and any... Um, I think they'll do okay against Arla Dragon Guard. But I would probably keep them away from things like Loki and Osram or 
definitely any of the other um, local, any local flag room they might do okay against, given their high attack and decent defense. Uh, but, you know, they are sword masters. They have their use on the battlefield. Uh, just watch out for crossbows, really, with them, and they'll do you wonders. Going into the third tier, the army barracks will start off with the barons. Your first very heavily armored infantry unit. 11 attack, 24 defense, good, very good morale with a good response, and they inspire your nearby troops. So, just an excellent upgraded uh, sword unit. I would say, in terms of stats, they're comparable to Gondor infantry. Better defense, um, and I believe slightly higher attack, so they're a bit above Gondor infantry, though worse than, say, uh, Wardens of the White Tower, which would be the next tier above them when it comes to sword and board infantry. But I've always been a big fan of these guys. I love the heavy set armor on them, and I really like the round um, helmets with the open faces here um, on some of them that have like the chainmail kind of face mask going on, and the others just have the visors here. So I'm always a big fan of the Barons. Great units to have. They are quite expensive. I want to say they're about 425 in upkeep, so they are expensive, um, but they are a very elite and solid infantry sword and board unit that you can rely on. Next to them, we have the premier unit of the Dalian Infantry, the Barding Herd. Get rid of the shield that they're equipping, though they are on the back, actually. But give them a halberd, or I guess it's more of a bardiche pole halberd? I, I'm not really sure what you would classify this weapon as, because it's... I guess it's kind of a form of halberd. It just doesn't have the spike tip on it, though I don't... I guess you don't necessarily need to have a spike tip. Anyway, 7 attack, 21 defense, good against mounts and armor. Uh, they do have the pike wall, but again, this is just like the, uh, pretty much just like the Dalian Billman, where it doesn't really help them too much against cavalry charges, but their higher defense skill, mass, and armor piercing, um, and high armor will allow them to do very well in those engagements. Their only real weakness would be crossbows or getting, like, rear charge or just overwhelmed, but they will serve you very, very well. Great unit to have, one of the premier units that makes Dale's infantry actually pretty respectable. Uh, that's pretty much all I can say about them. Great unit to have. Get them when you can. They'll do great up against runes, armor. They absolutely murder bodyguards, so mounted bodyguards. If you ever have to fight the Witch King, bring some of these with you. Uh, if you ever have to fight Nazgul or Lyron or anyone else from Dogal Durr or the Lokrim bodyguards, these guys are your ideal counter. Though the Lokrim bodyguards do outmatch them, but they have more men, so it kind of works out in their favor. That will do it for the uh, infantry, so now we will move on to the archers. At the first tier, we have the Dalian Longbowmen, a very, very nice unit for Dale, actually. Kind of bread and butter, I would say so. Get plenty of these guys. Three attack, four missile, six defense doesn't seem like much, but they do have a 180 meter range, which is quite high. Um, they are living up to that Longbowman name, so that is very good range. Only average accuracy, but they will start shooting the enemy before they get shot at back, so that's a nice advantage of them. They do get the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they do get the visual armor upgrades, which I will show later on in the video, same as the other daily units. A great unit to have, I would say recruit as many of these into your army as you can in the early game. I would shoot for at least like six of them, and you will just have a devastating firing line that can basically out skirmish the enemy before they even get in range of fighting back against the longbows. Great unit to have there. Next off, we'll go into the second tier of the archery range. We have the Barding Marksman. The Barding Marksman, 6 attack, uh, 6 melee, and 6 missile with 14 total defense. They go up to 200 meters of range with 30 missiles and high accuracy. Solid archer, I would say kind of on par with the Gondor archers, though a bit better in both attack, and I believe the defense is about the same as Gondor. I really should have Gondor just laid out on my second monitor as kind of like a guide for... Uh, stats to compare it to, because I find Gondor is kind of like the de facto standard of, you know, how a unit might be balanced. You would compare, like, your militia units to Gondor militia, for example. Anyway, solid range unit. Uh, less men, only 127, but very good to have. They do not have a visual upgrade, but I believe they do get they do get armor upgrades, so make sure you get those Corbin Blacksmiths just to make these guys a bit more uh, durable. And next to them are the Athalo Rangers, a special ranger in the fact that they have the highest range and the highest movement speed of the rangers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know the range is true. Um, a while back, I want to say version 3, I couldn't find the changelog for it, but I want to say version 3 was the ranger update where each of the rangers were made unique. The Othala rangers have the highest range and the highest 
mobility. So very fast, good at covering long distances, and that high meter range means you should be able to get away with skirmishing with the Athala Rangers without them ever getting shot back. That's what I'm trying to say here. Excellent stamina as a part of that. Six missile attack, very high accuracy. Not the best accuracy of Rangers, as I know the Athelian Rangers are exceptional and these are only very high, but they make up for it with their extended range. So a great unit to have. You can get these in pretty much all of the Ravonian regions and the northeastern Dale settlements along the river up to Skarn, as I said earlier. And finally, your elite unit, the Hearthguard of Dale, which should be, yeah, they are Area of Restriction in Dale or Eskaroth only. Will you get these guys? They have stakes. They are good against armor with the arrows because they have the black arrows. Nine melee attack. They have spear and shield equipped. Seven missile and 25 total defense. Mostly armor, but a good six to their shield. These guys are fantastic. Being that they can lay stakes, they can be useful to cover your flanks from enemy cavalry and have a defensive position where they can hold their own. And should cavalry even reach them, they will fight back very well with their spear and shield combo. No real weaknesses other than enemy elite infantry and being swarmed. Obviously, you'll want to keep them away from, like, you know, a bunch of Uruk Slayers coming your way or, like, Lok Flag Rim and Mass. Um, chariots, for example, would, would still do some damage to them, though they'd probably do okay against Chariots. Very great unit, very good at, like, holding their own with that high armor skill. Get as many of these as you can, and they will pay dividends for your faction with the... Um, armor piercing arrows and they should have yeah high accuracy a little less range than your other units at only 170 but they make up for it with those heavy set arrows which also have their own unique uh projectile trail it's kind of this black smoky like trail that you can see to know that you're being shot by armor piercing arrows that does it for the range contingent of dale again a very bow focused faction no crossbows or anything like that but they do get two um, units, their bodyguard, and the hearth guard with armor piercing arrows, so it's kind of a specialty of them. Lastly, we'll go into the cavalry, starting off with the Dale cavalry. Um, five attack, ten defense, so more or less Gondor militia, though they do have a relatively high upkeep cost. I want to say it's like 345 off the top of my head, so not a higher cost to field these guys. So Dale is not so much of a cavalry nation, though they do have good options for cavalry. Um, you'll be using these a lot if you play as the dwarves of Erebor, for example, as it's your only real cavalry unit outside of these and like Rovanian riders so solid unit uh good at like you know taking down other light units um archers that sort of thing rear charging with seven charge though they don't have any bonuses against cavalry and a lot of the cavalry you will be fighting are actually good against cavalry that being wargs the Arlad dragon riders and the uh Barun raiders which are what was once the Kondish uh raiders from before the mounted horse archers those three units you'll be fighting most in terms of cavalry, and the Dale cavalry just cannot fight back. They will get absolutely crushed, so do watch out for that. Um, I have lost many a Dale cavalry contingent trying to chase down Pondish raiders on horseback, and uh, yeah, it doesn't go well for them. They get absolutely demolished. Even if they get the charge off, they will take lots of casualties from those cavalry. So only really good against enemy archers and supporting your front lines with hammer and anvil targets. Um, or chasing down routing enemies keep them away from cavalry on cavalry combat or at least have some spears nearby to support them as they will fall quickly to other horses next up we have the iwulthiado horse guards a unique unit actually these are horse archers with lances so seven melee attack uh five missile with average accuracy 28 of those lower range at 120 but a 10 charge bonus and 16 defense they are good against other cavalry, so you'll want to use these to fight off, like, uh, the Baroon, or not the Baroon, yeah, I guess the Baroon Raiders, yeah, I, get, I still get those names mixed up, and the Aralog Dragon Riders, so ideally you would use up their arrows first before committing them to melee. These guys are considered them your outriders, they'll go out first, scare with the enemy as your longbows pepper them from range, and then once the enemy lines have engaged, you have a very powerful lancing uh, unit that can also take care of other cavalry for you. But you know they are only available in Rovanian regions um, and regions around your homeland up to Skarn. As you get kind of deeper into Rune, you won't be able to recruit these guys around the Sea of Rune. But you should have plenty of infrastructure at that point that it doesn't really matter. And finally, the last cavalry unit, we have the Earls. Basically take the Barons and put them on a horse. 10 attack, 22 defense, so losing a little bit of defense there. But they inspire nearby troops. They are good against other cavalry and have a nice charge of 8 there. A little bit slower being that they are a heavy cavalry. But a fantastic unit to get 
The Wilddale is more so a archer nation. They have respectable cavalry options, though they are expensive. So if you want good cavalry, be prepared to pay a premium for it, even for the Dalian cavalry. Your only real cheap cavalry would come in the form of Rovanian riders, which I talked about in the brief video, I believe. I might have actually not talked about them there. If I did, I'm mistaken. But they're basically just like a Dale Cavalry version light, essentially. So now I'll just go ahead and show the armor upgrades and then we'll conclude out the video. And welcome back to the battle map side. As we look at the armor upgrades, I'm just going to scan through here. The Dalian Swordsmen kind of take up the look of the Lake Town Pikes here with the kind of, uh, I forgot what this type of helmet's called, but they got the helmets and the shoulder pads and the uh, kind of chest pieces that the Lake Town Pikes use. The Dalian Swordmasters get more of a kind of lamellar scale or whatever this is, chainmail tabards here versus the kind of tunic look from before. The Lake Town Pikemen now come with chest pieces here at the i believe this is the dwarven armor upgrades so tier four they get plate chests give them additional defense the dalian longbowmen also adopt the same style as them before along with the dalian billmen so a bit of a uniform look here a lot of blue in the roster the ravanian godrops also get new chest pieces here more of this kind of scale mail that happens and with the dale cavalry again adopting the lake town pikeman unit and finally going into the royal guardsmen who pick up better chest pieces so you do get some visual upgrades as dale and speaking of visual upgrades as i said earlier dale will be getting somewhat of an overhaul uh to what extent i cannot give at this point yet nor say for certain either myself but they will at least get a military overhaul perhaps just in the visual department but that will be coming in version 6 for now uh dale is mostly unchanged from where they were in version 4.6 though there have been some changes, mostly just with their given um, script units and the availability of them. So anyway, next on, if you have been following up with the alphabetical order of things, the Principality of Dol Emroth will be next. So they will be the faction for next week's video. And then, I forget who's after them. It's, I think it's it would be Dorwinian after them. And then Dunland and so on and so forth. So hope you guys are enjoying version 5. Um, I will say I've been playing a personal campaign of Gondor lately, and that's been actually really fun. And I've gotten to see that the uh, Knights of the Silver Swan are absolutely outstanding and just amazing to have when you're playing a Gondor campaign. So I'm excited to do the Dual Amroth video. I don't play Dual Amroth too much, but they are admittedly one of the factions that really had me interested in Divide and Call. Excuse me, these hiccups came back. Uh, in Divide and Conquer when I first learned about it back in version like 1.2 or 2.2? It was it was way back, way back in the day. And I was like, whoa, the Swan Knights, Dolan Roth, that is so cool. And uh, I mean, I've been here ever since. So I've been in Divide and Conquer for a long time. And Dolan Roth is definitely one of the reasons why. So I look forward to doing that video next week. And until then, my friends... Hope you are enjoying the version 5, and until next time, my friends, farewell.